praise you, Lord, I praise you, oh, I praise you, yes, I praise you, how I praise you, my precious Lord. I love you, Lord, I love you, oh, I love you, yes, I love you, Lord, I love you, my lovely Lord. You are worthy, Lord, you're worthy, so you're worthy, so worthy, oh, you're worthy, most holy Lord. Oh, the heavens and the earth, oh, they all shout and proclaim, oh, there's no Tonight's message is going to be on spiritual desert. What is a spiritual desert? Is there something called a spiritual desert? And uh, we're going to go through a few verses. Um, but we're going to look into what a spiritual desert is and why some of us go through it. Not everybody goes through it, but some people go through it place called desert and there's a specific period also so each person's desert experience varies and the duration varies so we're gonna look from God's Word and see few of God's people who went through the desert why did they have to go through the desert and how did they go through it and how did they come through the desert experience so first we're gonna um, see what is a desert. A desert is a dry, barren area of empty land. It's a deserted place. And what we all know, even if we have not been to the desert, we know from what we've heard or what we've learned that it's a dry place and it's an empty place. And we also know that there's not much water, not much food, other than dates and some desert plants the we see in the desert and not too many animals not too many people in the desert so desert is not a very friendly environment it's not a very friendly uh, atmosphere for most people yet the Lord takes us through the desert sometimes so we're going to um, see why God takes us through the desert first of all what does the desert have to offer us? What do we see in the desert? What does it have to offer us? It can only offer us lack of water, sometimes lack of food, sometimes um, lack of provision are basic necessities that we need. We don't find that in the desert. So most people, they will not want to go through the desert. And what happens is the people who go through the desert a lot of times they feel lonely and they don't have many people walking with them in the desert and we also have a lot of people who blame people who are going through the desert saying that oh it is your fault you don't know how to go through the desert and some people will give advice also as to how we should walk through the desert when they don't even have a clue of what the desert is like so so we can hear all these things, and, a, and especially for a person who is walking through the desert, it's very difficult um, in every area, from people who will blame them, from people who will try to advise them, and from people who say that, oh, you, should ha you shouldn't have chosen the path of the desert. You know, when there's so much greenery on the other side, who told you to walk through the desert? But one thing we need to have in mind, that if we are walking a righteous life, and we are going through the desert, God is with us. It is not because of our sins that we are going through the desert. So if we are not going through a difficult time because of our sins, then we can be assured by the Lord that He will walk with us through the desert. He will go before us. We are going to see from the Bible how the Lord actually went through 
the desert with the people of God. Now, the people of God did not walk by themselves, but the Lord went. He went ahead of them. He went with them. And it's a beautiful thing that what the Lord did, even through the desert, how the Lord formed them. And why do we have to go through the desert? We're going to see um, James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. We can read James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. And verse 12, James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, incomplete, lacking nothing. Verse 2 to 4. We'll read one more time. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Trials are not... Um, sins. Trials are something that we go through because of leading a righteous life, the path that God has ordained for us to test us, to prove our faith. This is not presumptuous sin. People cannot say that, oh, I fell because that's my trial and I had to go through this trial and um, this is the reason why um, I don't want to be a Christian because I'm having a lot of trials. Basically, what they're doing is they're holding on to their sin and blaming God for the trials. God will never um, send um, sin, you know, temptations in order for somebody to fall. So trials are, we're going to see what trials are. When we look in the Bible to see what God's people went through, it is not a circumstance of um, making them to fall, but it is a circumstance where God allows trials when he takes us through and he walks with us because he knows that we will walk with him through that path of the desert. So when the Lord says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, that means basically it's testing, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So the testing of our faith produces patience. That is the result he's saying when our faith is tested, it has to produce patience. And that is the outcome that the Lord is looking for from his children when they walk through the trials. And then he says, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So this patience is leading us toward perfection. So the ultimate goal of the Lord is for us to grow into perfection. So in order for us to grow into perfection, He's leading us through the desert. Now, like I said before, the desert is not going to be forever. It has a particular time frame, duration, and it's not going to be the same for everybody. And the Lord knows how long a person can walk through the desert. And so for each person, that desert experience varies. We're going to um, read verse 12 also, James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures trials, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So when we go through the trial, there is also a reward. It's not just, okay, we're just going through the trials and uh, we're getting more patient and uh, we're becoming perfect. That's God's goal. God's goal is much more than that. He wants to give us the crown, eternal crown, everlasting crown that will not fade away. So that is the ultimate goal that God wants to give us for each and uh, to give each and every one of us who are his children. So there is a very specific outcome that God is looking for. God has in his mind, like every parent will have a goal for their children. God is much more, he's not self-oriented. He actually cares about us. And so he has a specific path made for each one of us, a specific desert experience made for each one of us for a short duration. So we're going to um, read Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 30 to 33. Deuteronomy 1, 30-33, about Moses. We all know about Moses, so we're not going to go into detail. But before we go into Moses, we're going to see how the Lord actually led his people. This is about the children of Israel, how the Lord led them in the wilderness, in the desert. Did he just leave them? in the desert and say, okay, you walk by yourself and you learn how to walk in the desert all by yourself? Or 
What did the Lord do? Chapter 1, verses 30 to 33. We're going to see how tender the Lord is. Verses 30 to 33. The Lord your God, who goes before you, he will fight for you, according to all he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. And in the wilderness, where you, say, where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Yet for all that you did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents, to show you the way you should go, in the fire by night and the cloud by day. Let's read it one more time. Deuteronomy chapter 1 verses 30 to 33. The Lord your God who goes before you, he will fight for you. We just have to slow down when we read. What is the Lord speaking to us through his word? How important that is. The Lord who created the heavens and the earth, he's saying that he will go before you and he will fight for you. So what do we have to be afraid of when we have to follow him if he's going to take us through the desert, if he's going before us and if he's going to fight for us? And he's saying, just like how he did, before the eyes of the Egyptians, God is saying that he will do it again. And this verse, even though it is written for the people during that time, it applies for us also. God is going before us, even now, as we walk through our desert experience. He is going before us. And he will fight for us. Whatever battles we have, God will fight for us. And verse 31, and in the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Um, I just think of this, like our children, you know, little ones when they walk after you know, a few minutes, they'll say, Mommy, my legs are hurting, Daddy, my legs are hurting. What does a parent do? They don't say, it's okay, keep walking, keep walking. You know? They know how far the child can walk and when it's time to carry the child. So how much more God is, he's speaking to us, how he carries his children. When we cannot go through certain paths, even in the wilderness, God says like he carries us through. God carries us through the wilderness like a father will carry the child on his shoulder. The Lord is saying he carried his people and he still does. He carries each one of us when we go through our desert. So how loving God is. God is so loving. The same God, same loving God who carried his people in the Old Testament He's still the same. He's the unchanging Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he still carries his people when we have to walk through our wilderness. And verse 33, it says, Who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents, to show you the way you should go in the fire by night and in the cloud by day. So the Lord is saying, you have to walk through the wilderness. But you know what I did for you? I went ahead. Even before you came through this path, I was already before you. You didn't have to do a thing. You didn't have to go search for a place to live. You didn't have to go look, looking for food. You didn't have to do any of those things. He's, he's saying that. I went before you. I went ahead of you. And I looked for a place. That means God is saying that how much he cared. He just didn't randomly say like, okay, go here, go there. You know, He actually picked a place. He actually picked a place for the children of Israel to pitch their tents. That's how much he cared. So how much more will the Lord care for us who are bought by the, blood, the precious blood of Jesus Christ? And when we are walking through our path, we should be so confident in the Lord. Whatever path we are going through, he is going before us. And what the Lord is doing is, he has already selected whatever needs to be selected for us. He, may, he makes that choice. When he makes that choice, it's always the best. And the Lord, he says, I'm going before you, and I make all the crooked paths straight. So whatever path is before us, no matter how crooked it is, we don't have to be worried because he's going before. So every step the Lord takes in front of us, every crooked place will start turning straight. So all we need to know is, am I following Jesus Christ? Is he going before us? And am I in this desert place because I'm following him? Or is it because of my disobedience? So that question we need to ask ourselves, that if I'm following the Lord, and the Lord is my leader who has led me into this desert, then 
for sure he's going before me he's making all the crooked places straight and he is actually if we need a job if we need a life partner if we need money whatever it is we can be so sure that he has gone before just like he said for the children of Israel that he went and he saw a place and he selected a place for them to just pitch their tent that is a temporary place how much more will the Lord do for us that is that was such a temporary place every place they have to pitch their tent and they have to keep moving but the Lord even took so much care for the children of Israel where they were going to pitch their tent and he actually saw the place went ahead of the God who created the heaven and earth imagine that him going before him making the choice for his people what a glorious experience it is so one more time we'll just read verse 33 who went in the way before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents to show you the way you should go in the fire by night and in the cloud by day this is such a beautiful verse it's a, it's a very deep verse because he could have sent one angel okay go you know scout this place and come and tell me which place is good but he's showing how much he's involved in our lives and how much he cares for us that he himself goes and looks for a place for his people so we thank God because we have such a loving father who cares for us so much he not only selects places people whatever we need in our lives but also he carries us through the desert he carries us as a father carries the children so thank God we have such a loving Savior I'm gonna read Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 2 to 5 Deuteronomy chapter 8 verses 2 to 5 you can see how the Lord led the people a few more verses before we look at the lives of men and women of God who walked through the desert Deuteronomy 8 2 to 5 and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not so he humbled you allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know nor did your fathers know that he might make you know what he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord your garments did not wear out on you nor did your foot swell these 40 years you should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son so the Lord your God chastens you this is another beautiful passage where the Lord says on purpose he didn't give food and the reason why he didn't give food is not to see them starve because he wanted to feed them heavenly food the reason why he didn't give them water in the wilderness he took them through a place where there's no water because he wanted to show his power that only his people can see the supernatural hand of the Lord the supernatural working of the Lord only God's people who follow the Lord can see only the children of Israel tasted manna only the children of Israel drank water out of the rock in a desert only the children of Israel had the experience of walking in the wilderness for 40 years without their sandals being worn out and their clothes still remained the same so those are very substantial miracles that they went through that we cannot compare that with whatever we're going through so we have to uh, know why the Lord is taking us through the desert if the Lord is taking us through the desert that means there's a very specific purpose specific plan that God has in our mind what the Lord is showing through these verses is God wants to reveal to us his glory he wants to reveal to us the things of the kingdom of God that cannot be revealed to us in any ordinary way so the Lord said that's the reason specifically he didn't give it in order to give heavenly food if we have earthly food there's no need for heavenly food we're not going to get hungry we're not going to ask for you know food so the Lord brought them to a point where they said Lord we need food and the Lord gave them not any food but he gave them heavenly food angels food so once again we see how much care God shows for his people that he just not he doesn't just give any ordinary thing he gives his best just like he went and he picked places when they asked for food he gave 
the richest food, which is from heaven, heavenly food the Lord gave. So God is such a loving God. And for us to follow him, it is such a blessing to know who we are following. Until we know who we are following, we'll be unsure of where we are going, even though he can be the Lord of the universe. Until we know his nature, how good he is. He's, he's much more than an earthly father. He's much more than an earthly mother. He always looks to give us the best, and he can give us the best. Earthly parents, even if we want to, a lot of times we're not able to. But God is able to, and he will. And even though he is God, he does not say that, okay, I'm God. I'm not going to do anything for you. Or I'm only going to do little for you. He's not like the gods that we see in other religions, where like he has a big ego, and he's always trying to threaten. The Lord of the Old Testament is such a loving God. A lot of times people say, the, oh, the Old Testament God is a very ferocious, you know, God of anger who just slays people. That is not true. When we really read the Bible, give careful attention to who God is in the Old Testament. He has not changed a bit. He's the same God, same loving God in the Old Testament, and he's the same loving God in the New Testament. And how much care he takes to feed his people, and how much do you think it would break his heart when those people, after receiving everything, they continued rebelling, continued doubting, continued um, cursing, and disobeying the Lord. So, thank God we have a Lord, a Heavenly Father, who not only calls himself as a Heavenly Father, but he acts. The way he behaves to us is so tender, so loving. He is our Heavenly Father. He is the Father beyond any father in this world. So thank God for that. Now we know people who are going through the desert are following such a loving Heavenly Father. Some of the people who went through the desert were Joseph, we're not going to go into detail with Joseph. We saw about Joseph the past few weeks ago, so we're not going to go into detail. We know the story about Joseph. But uh, what the Lord wants to speak to us from Joseph, um, Joseph's life is uh, Psalm 105, verse 17 to 22. Psalm 105, verse 17 to 22. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in iron. Until the time that his word came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions. Verse 22, to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his elders wisdom. We'll read it one more time. Verse 17 to 22, he sent a man before them. God sent a man before them, and his name was Joseph. And what Joseph had to go through was he was sold as a slave, and they hurt his feet with fetters. That was in prison. He was thrown into prison, and he was laid in irons. Not because he did something wrong, but he was in prison because somebody falsely accused him. But did God know about this? Yes, God knew about this. People from outside, when they look at Joseph's life, they can say everything is going wrong in this person's life. Surely, just like we see with Job's life, surely there's something terribly wrong with this person. And he deserves this. He, he thought he escaped one. Look what God is doing. He's coming around catching him again. Now, from being a slave, he's being thrown into the prison. But the Lord says that he was with Joseph. Just as the father carries his son, the Lord carried Joseph through his prison time. But the purpose, just like we saw in James chapter 1, we're seeing what God did over here. Why did Joseph go through this? Why did they hurt his feet with fetters? Why did um, the Lord allow him to be sold? Because God's word was trying Joseph. It was a testing period for Joseph. And very clearly we see that there was a period. It was a very specific appointed period by the Lord in Joseph's life that he was tested. So the Lord is saying when that time was over, then the Lord sent people to take him out of the prison. So that applies to you and me who are going through the desert experience that there is a specific period. 
we're not going to be always in the desert. We have a very specific period, and when the word of the Lord tries us, and when we are done, when we pass our test, when we go, grow from faith to faith, when our faith comes forth as gold, God, at that time, he will take us out of a desert. He'll say, well done, you accomplished. Not by ourselves, because God is going before us. He is actually doing everything. What we are doing is following him. And so the Lord rewards us for following him, basically. So we're going to um, go through another verse from um, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. Hebrews 11, 27. And this we're going to see about Moses. We know about Moses also. How Moses was born to Hebrew parents and how he was thrown into the river by his mother and father because they feared for Moses' life and how a princess, Egyptian princess, took, her, took him and tried to raise him uh, when they found the little baby in the basket floating on that river, Nile. And how God, at every moment, watched over this child, Joseph, uh, Moses. And this Moses is in the palace. But what did Moses do? Was he content in the palace? Very clearly, God's word is showing what choice did Moses make. Did he make a choice? Did he have a choice to make in allowing God to take him through the desert? So the Spirit of the Lord can take us through the desert. The Spirit of the Lord can call us. I'm going to take you through the desert, but we have an opportunity whether to receive that call and go into the desert, or we can say, Lord, I do not want this desert. I want it out, and the Lord will say, okay. God will never force anyone to walk through the desert. So with Moses, verse 27, Hebrews 11, verse 27, you see, by faith, he forsook Egypt, it was Moses, not fearing the wrath of the king, but he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Once again, we can trace this back to James chapter 1. When you endure, what happens? So the endurance is so important when we walk through any desert experience. Endurance is very, very important that we endure. Even um, two weeks ago, when we saw about a good soldier, endure hardship. As a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So Moses, he endured. He endured the affliction. He endured the threat. He endured losing his very life. He took a big risk. But he knew God was greater than Pharaoh. He knew God was able to keep him. And he had that vision that God had a plan for him in his life. So we have to have the same vision, same focus, that when we walk through a desert, we are not walking aimlessly. We are not going to be going around and round and round unless we disobey. If you're walking with the Lord, every turn that we take through the desert is a turn of victory toward exiting the desert successfully, being crowned by the Lord. For prayer, please contact us at prayer at LBFL International Ministries dot org. That's prayer at LBFL International Ministries dot org. Or you may phone us at 001-845-360-0534. Once again, 001-845-360-0534. You may write us at El Bethel International Ministries, PO Box 966, Goshen, New York, 10924, USA. On the web, please visit us at www.elbethelinternationalministries.org.